Praise the Lord. Let's turn today to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 17. We read these words. And the king went forth, and all the people after him, and tarried in a place that was far off. And all his servants passed on beside him, and all the Cherethites, and the Pelethites, and the Gittites, six hundred men, which came after him from Gath, passed on before the king. Then said the king to Ittai the Gittite, Wherefore goest thou also with us? Return to thy place, and abide with the king, for thou art a stranger, and also an exile. Whereas thou camest but yesterday, should I this day make thee go up and down with us? Seeing I go whither I may, return thou, and take back thy brethren. Mercy and truth be with thee. And Ittai answered the king, and said, As the Lord liveth, and as my Lord the king liveth, surely in what place my Lord the king shall be, whether in death or in life, even there also will thy servant be. Praise the Lord. Whether in death or, death or in life, the servant will be with the Lord. For the servant serves his Lord unto death. Today, Christians do not want to serve the Lord. They want the Lord to serve them. They want Jesus to die on a cross for them so they can go about and live their daily lives as if nothing had happened, put their salvation in their back pocket, go on and eat and drink with the drunken, go and defraud other men in business, continue to lie, continue to lust, continue to watch pornography. Christians today have decided they will not serve their Lord. For to serve the Lord is to do all that the Lord commands, even unto death, to go where He sends. We sing the great hymn that says, We will go where Thou sends us. And we sing all types of hymns that teach us that we need to serve the Lord and do what He says because we love Him. We are the servants of the Lord. Let's turn to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 2 Kings Second Kings chapter 2 Let me find it here Second Kings chapter 2, verse 2. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And then we go to verse 4. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 4. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 6, we read, And Elisha said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee, here. 
Tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. Elisha three times said he would not leave Elijah the prophet. He was his disciple. He will not leave his master. Elijah loved his master. Elisha loved his master Elijah and he would not leave him. Let's turn to Ruth. Ruth chapter one verse fourteen. This is the story of Ruth Ruth and her mother in law Naomi and her sister in law Oprah Orpha. And Naomi said to them, after Naomi, their mother-in-law, lost her husband and lost her two sons, which were married to Ruth and to Orpah. She said, go back to your mothers, go back to your own mothers and live with them and you can get new husbands. And we read in Ruth chapter 1, verse 14. And they lift up their voice and went again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God. Ruth would not leave her mother-in-law. Ruth would not leave her mother-in-law. Whither thou goest, I go. Your God will be my God. And all throughout the Bible, we have servants. We have people that serve thank the Lord for that. Let's turn. Let's turn to Acts chapter 11 verse 23. This is speaking about Barnabas. Barnabas, who when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Cleave unto the Lord. Ruth cleaved to her mother-in-law, Naomi, when Orpah decided to go back. But Ruth cleaved to Naomi. And Barnabas exhorts all the brethren to cleave unto the Lord. Let's turn to Acts chapter 21 verse 10. This is speaking of Paul. And we tarried there many days. There came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we had heard these things, both we and they of that place, 
besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Agabus the prophet spoke the words of the Holy Ghost and said, Whoever owns this girdle is going to be bound in Jerusalem. And they all beseeched Paul, please don't go to Jerusalem. Please don't go. And Paul said, I am ready to be bound and ready to die for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. For Paul was a servant of the Lord. Paul was ready to die, to be martyred, to give his life for the one who gave eternal life to him on the cross that day at Calvary. Jesus Christ did more than any of us could ever imagine to give us the hope of eternal life, which is through faith in His name and in His work on the cross and the resurrection that God resurrected Him from the grave and lifted Him up to the right hand of the Father, being made a high priest for us, so that with boldness we can enter into that holy place when we are absent from the body and present with the Lord to boldly enter into where God is seated and Jesus the Lord is there waiting. Paul said he's ready to die for that Lord. Paul wanted to serve the Lord Jesus. How? By preaching the gospel, the good news. You see, if we've been saved, born again, if we've received that blessed hope, then we can look to others who are lost Let's call them what they really are, damned. We can look to others who are damned in this world and have compassion on them and preach the gospel which is within us if we've truly been saved. If we truly believe, then we have the gospel to preach. No, we don't keep it in our back pockets. We don't continue to live like the world, living in sin. We don't continue to cry how weak of a sinner we are. No, we serve our Lord unto death. We should be ready to serve. People always want to know, well, what can I do to serve the Lord? Uh, can I go and be a missionary? Can I, can I go and visit the people in the hospital? Can I go to the prisons? But serving the Lord is to preach the gospel. That was his final request. Not even a request. That was his final commandment. Before he rose up to the Father, he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's the Great Commission. We have to preach and teach the gospel, which is good news. Many Christians today don't even know what the gospel is. And you have to wonder if they're even saved. How can you not know what the good news is? That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that Christ was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And if, that, if we'll repent and confess our sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we believe. Let's turn. 2 Corinthians. Before we turn to 2 Corinthians, this week, when I was in Chinatown in Washington, D.C., preaching the gospel, serving the Lord, there was a man there who claimed to be a Muslim. And when I started preaching the King James Bible, when I said, that the King James Bible was infallible, inerrant, inspired. This man immediately started cursing, started accusing, started screaming and yelling. He was demon possessed. And all oh, the demons tremble at the word. The demons tremble at the holy word. For God has magnified one thing above his name, and that is his word. 
His word is magnified above even his name. So when I started preaching the King James Bible as the infallible word of God, for as it is written, in the beginning was the word, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is this word become flesh who dwelt among us. This man started screaming, yelling, claiming to be a Muslim. And he had another Muslim friend with him. And they started to push and pull and fight with another man who, from what I understand, was claiming to be a Jew, but then he claimed to be a Christian. But then supposedly he even claimed to be a Muslim. Either way, this man was going crazy out there, demon-possessed. And so as he claimed to be a Muslim and he claimed to hate white people, I lifted up my voice and gave him the gospel. Over and over again, I continued to deliver the gospel to that man, even though he didn't realize it. I was yelling as loud as I could the gospel because he claimed to be a Muslim. I told him that Muhammad is dead. Buddha's dead, Muhammad's dead, but Jesus lives. That Islam cannot save him, that Jesus saves. And this man finally calmed down and I continued to preach and he went away and I continued to preach and to lift up the word of God. And after I was finished preaching, I went over to that man and I gave his friend a gospel tract, which he started reading right away. And I went over to this man and I grabbed him by the hand and I said, I'm going to pray for you. What's your name? And his name was Jesus. Yeshua is his name, he said. Joshua, he called himself, but his real name is Yeshua, which is the name of Jesus. And so I prayed for him. And as I grabbed his hand, who he claimed to be a Muslim, I prayed the gospel to him, that he would believe the gospel, that he would be born again, that he would accept the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior, and that he would repent of his sins and release his anger. And that Muslim man thanked me. And the corner was quieted down because the gospel is peace. Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. To serve the Lord is to preach the gospel without fear of death. For we know who we have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I know who I have believed the Lord Jesus Christ, and I do not fear death, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Why? Because I'm going to heaven. And now we read 2 Corinthians. So if you don't know how to serve the Lord, it's simple. Stop being ashamed of the gospel. Preach the gospel to your neighbors. Now your neighbor doesn't mean just the person who lives next door to you. Your neighbor is an all-encompassing term that includes your friends and your enemies. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Love your enemies, love your friends. That means love your neighbor. But we're surrounded by friends and enemies, and they are our neighbors. So we can preach the gospel. That's how we serve the Lord. But only if you're not ashamed of the gospel. And only if you've stopped sinning or else you will be a hypocrite. There's many out there today that preach the gospel but continue in sin. I'm telling you the early church knows nothing about that. As a matter of fact for 1500 years they never heard of that doctrine. It was only until a man named John Calvin came and started preaching predestination eternal security, unconditional eternal security, that this doctrine came into being. But friends, I'm telling you today that in the scriptures, we are to flee from sin. We are to persevere. We are to endure until the end. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians. We are to serve the Lord. For He will cast down that unfruitful branch and cast it into the fire. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 2 Corinthians 
chapter 2, verse, excuse me, 2 Corinthians, chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Why would he say that if we were saved unconditionally? Why would we have to perfect holiness in the fear of God? Let's turn to John chapter 8. Verse 29, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees in this verse, John 8, 29, And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. The Father had not left Jesus alone, because Jesus always did those things that pleased the Father. Are you pleasing the Father? Jesus Christ came from the Father. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the Godhead bodily. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are fulfilled in a body. And that body belongs to Jesus Christ. Are you pleasing Him? And he, sent, and he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. Why? For I do always those things that please him. And as he spake these words, many believed him. Then said Jesus, in verse 31, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. Now he's speaking to the Jews that believed on him, not to the Pharisees that don't believe. Now he continues and he turns and he speaks to those Jews who are believing in him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, This means, truly, truly, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the Son abideth forever. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. The only way that you can abide in the house forever is to be one with the Son. For the servant leaves the house, the servant abideth not in the house forever. He's talking about an earthly servant, an earthly house, an earthly son. The earthly servant does not live in an earthly house forever. But the son of the father in that house lives in that house forever. So if the son is pleased with that servant, and that servant and that son become one, and that servant cleaves to him, and that servant makes himself one with his master, then he can stay in the house forever. But Jesus says in verse 34, John 8, 34, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. You cannot be a servant of sin and a servant of the Lord. It is impossible. You might deceive yourself and think that it's possible, but it is not. Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. 
So if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Let's turn to John. First John. Excuse me, first John. Chapter 3. Verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. What is the works of the devil? To cause people to sin. He caused Adam to sin. He caused Eve to sin. He causes you to sin. You cannot serve sin and be a servant of the Lord. John 3.8 says, 1 John 3.8 says, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. The works of the devil are to cause you to sin. The Son of God was manifested to cleanse you from sin, that he might destroy sin in your life. For you cannot be a servant of sin and abide in the house forever. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Now listen to this one. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Let no man deceive you. If you're not doing works of righteousness, you are not righteous, according to the scriptures. And we are to preach and exhort the brethren with this doctrine, that he that has been saved by such a lively hope and a grace and a glorious everlasting salvation in the heavens with God and all the holy angels and the holy saints and martyrs, that someone like that who's been saved to that highest degree that's going to go to paradise, eternal happiness one day, that someone like that should be thankful and should cleave to his Lord who died for him and who bore the wrath of an angry God for him. Jesus is your Lord. He died for you. He bore the wrath of an angry God on that cross for you. And because he did it for you, he gives you a way out. Call upon his holy name. Let the wicked man forsake his way. Turn from sin. Let's turn to John chapter 8. Verse 44. Well, how can I stop sinning, preacher? Let me explain to you what sin is. Sin is lying. Sin is lusting. Sin is hating, murdering, drinking with the drunken. Sin is not being merciful. Sin is not loving. So how can you stop sinning? By perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's how you stop sinning. You perfect holiness. You cleanse yourself in the fear of God, as Paul wrote. Let's turn to John 8, chapter 44. John chapter 8, verse 44. We read these words. He's speaking to the believers now, Jesus. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father will ye do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar, and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinces me of sin? If you hear the truth today, 
and you believe it not. If you think that what I'm saying to you is a lie, if you think that what I'm preaching right now is not the truth, then ye are of your father the devil, because I'm preaching the truth from the Holy Scriptures. He that committeth sin is of the devil. Ye are of your father the devil, Jesus says, to those who believed in him. It's not about just believing in him. For Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 39, they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, well, why do they say that Abraham is our father? It's the same doctrine that the Christians have today. One saved, always saved. All one saved, always saved. They said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. If ye were Jesus' children, if ye were the children of the Father in heaven, ye would do the works of the Father in heaven. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, verse... Let me find it. Matthew 13, verse 39, excuse me, Matthew 13, verse 38. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burnt in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth then shall the righteous shine forth in this, as the sun in the kingdom of their father who hath ears to hear let him hear the righteous shall shine forth in the kingdom of their Father. And in 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Are you doing righteousness? Are you serving the Lord? Are you loving your brother? How can I serve the Lord, preacher? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And I'm going to pray that you do that. Praise the Lord!